Uh, as we open your word now, there's lots of things that would uh, strive to distract us. And we know certainly the enemy does not want us focusing on you and your word. Uh, I believe that you want to speak to me this morning. I believe you want to speak to all of us about how we, we miss having the right perspective as we look out at our world, as we experience the things that we experience. And I just pray now, God, that you'd speak to us and help us to turn our eyes from the things that we see and experience and, and to you and your perspective. And so please help us. Uh, please help us, Lord. Please speak to us. We pray in Christ's name. I find myself struggling. I don't know about you, but I find myself struggling when I see godless and faithful people prosper. You know, especially if you have, like, friends in school that you know, you know they're not, certainly not trying to follow God, but you know that what they're doing is maybe crooked or they're lying, or maybe you know they're cheating on tests or, you know, family members that are cheating on their taxes, and they just seem to be doing well. They actually seem to be prosper, prospering. They seem to be getting away with their faithlessness. While I try to live faithfully, I strive to live faithfully. Yes, I fall, I struggle, just like we all do. But it seems that sometimes I get a, a struggling experience when I'm trying to live faithful, and yet other people who are obviously not living faithful, faithfully are getting what seems to be prosperity. And I wonder, is faithfulness in the Christian life a worthwhile pursuit? And maybe some of you have asked that question, and maybe this morning you might ask that question afresh and anew. Is being faithful even worthwhile? Is the Christian life a worthwhile pursuit? Why not just do my own thing? And uh, like I used to think when I was a teenager, I'll, you know, when I'm like in my mid-20s, I'll get things right, but I want to live for myself right now. How about you? Does it ever annoy you to see godless people enjoying the good life? I mean, man, that just bothers me sometimes. Maybe it bothers you. Maybe you see the popular party kids. Maybe you even see those, those kids that are in the atheist club. Or, or your colleagues who, you know, they're, they're, atheist. they're obviously living an anti-God, a godless life. And they seem to be prospering. Or that successful crooked CEO. How, how come he gets to get away with those things? And I don't. Uh, or sometimes we look at the media, or we see the rich and the famous, we see people who are just prospering. And then when we learn something about their lifestyle, we, they're so faithless to God, and yet they seem to be blessed while they shun God. They're faithless to His ways. While, while many Christians, probably some people that you know, maybe many of you, you're striving to be faithful, to do what you know is right in the sight of God, and yet it feels empty, or maybe it feels lonely. Your experience in school is not one of abundance, of abundant life. You don't have the abundant circle of friends. You don't have the prosperity that you see in others. I have a good friend. Uh, his name is Nathan. I know him from college. I've shared with you before. He's 31 years old, had a massive stroke about eight weeks ago. And uh, for the first few days, it was, it's even a lip. And they had emergency brain surgery and, and uh, released pressure in his brain. And his whole life, I mean, just in one day, this is a guy that's doing youth ministry up at a place called Word of Life, where Laura and I came from, where we were on staff before. And he has a powerful ministry. Uh, had, you know, has video blogs and teaching and things where he's influencing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, uh, probably thousands of teenagers around the country. And he's massive story. Why, why did that happen to him? Why did that have to happen to him? By the way, he's doing better. He just walked into his home last week, amazingly. And if you want to see the video of that, I posted it on Facebook. It's just amazing to see what God is doing. But there's this tension between the prosperity of those who are faithless and the struggle of those who are trying to be faithful. Thankfully, God's Word does give us the remedy. We're going to see that in Psalm 73. If you'll listen to what God says this morning, I believe that you will not only understand the normalness, the normalness of that tension, of that, of that struggle to keep a proper view of life and perspective, but you also get the answers you need to help you to realign your perspective so that you can see clearly. You can see clearly. I often find 
a tension between what I believe about God, what I believe is true, and then what I see and what I experience and what I feel. And this has always been a struggle for the people of God. It's a struggle for all of the people of God, as a matter of fact. And it's not just you out there. <laughs> you know, it, it's not just the, the normal you know, people out there who, who struggle like that. It's, it's leaders. And in Scripture, in Psalm 73, we see a worship leader who really struggles with this tension. His name is Asaph. He was a worship leader for King David. Can you imagine? I mean, this was the cream of the crop worship man and experience. I mean, it was only the chosen ones. Actually, there's Scripture that tell, tells us that they were seeking people who were filled with the Holy Spirit. Just like the people that would be qualified for church leadership, that was the same kind of qualifications to lead worship. And Asaph was in this amazing time in history with King David, and he was the worship leader. And in Psalm 73, verse 1, Asaph kind of starts with the, the end. He gives us the conclusion. He says, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. And he's going to tell us a story. We all like stories, don't we? And we're going we're gonna to get a glimpse this morning of Asaph's story, of his experience and his struggle and how that struggle was released, that tension was released. And that's, I believe, God's desire for all of us. But he starts with the end of the mind. It's almost like he says, I'm going to tell you a story, but, and it's going to be hard. There's tension in there, but just know that God is good. That God is good. And then he says, he begins this contrast, and he says, but, verse 2, as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. What seems to be happening is that Asaph has an isolated experience. He's, he's living uh, in, this, in this period of time where he's kind of isolating himself. And he's seeing the, the prosperity of the wicked and he's envious and he's jealous for those blessings that they seem to be getting. He sees the prosperity, and he it's like he wants that, right? I, I want that. I, I'm pretty content to watch the football game tonight on my, you know, 42-inch TV. But, you know, my buddy's got a 70-inch TV. And, and at one point in time, this, this buddy was actually a, a worship leader. And I, he hasn't fallen away from the Lord or anything, but he's just, you know, out there just making a bunch of money, you know. And what? He's got that big TV. And all these people go to his house. He's ministering to all these people tonight at the Super Bowl party. And I want to have that kind of Super Bowl party. I mean, I can only invite a few people to my house because we can only crowd so many people around a little 42-inch TV. But if I had a 70-inch TV, if I had a bigger house, if I had a bigger room, man, we'd just think of the party that we could throw in, the people we could minister to. So there's all kinds of subtle ways that we can fall into this uh, jealousy and this envy. And so here, Asaph begins to contrast what's true about God and yet the tension of what he sees and what he's experiencing. And he goes on to describe this. He says in verse 4, they have no struggles. We know that's not true, right? We know they just struggle. But that's it looks like they, they're just high on the hog. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. Isn't that, that kind of, it's kind of human. They're free from common human burdens. I mean, do you ever look out and you see somebody who's prospering and you just think, they just have it so good. They're, they're healthy and wealthy and wise. Uh, why do I hurt when I get up in the morning? I don't feel good. I'm not prospering like they are. But we know that's not true. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts come iniquity. Then evil imaginations have no limits. He goes on. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. 
Why aren't all these people prospering and they just come together and they just drink it up? Verse 11, they say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care. They go on amassing life. This is the way life seemed to operate. This was the experience that Asaph was seeing. Life seemed to work out for the faithless. And it seemed to work out pretty good. Do you know uh, some people like that? Do you know, uh, Vince and I were just talking last night and, and, and this past week talking about some you know, car troubles and it's just, it just seems like when you're having troubles, it's just one after another. He goes to pick up his car yesterday. It's supposed to be all done after several more. And then he's more car troubles. And it just keeps on. <laughs> and, and, and yet I, I see that. I see my neighbor. It just seems to be doing so well. My coworker. I know he's stealing stuff from the company. I know he's lying, you know, about this, that, and the other thing. Cheating on his wife. Whatever, you know. Certainly not being faithful to God. And yet he's... Driving that nice new car. His car never breaks down. How come his car never breaks down? My car's always broke down. So his conclusion is that the wealthy who are prospering have no trouble. They are always free of care. As if to say, that's what I want. That's the experience I want to have. I, I just don't want to worry anymore. How about you? I mean... You, Probably none of you came in this morning and thinking, boy, if I just had some more troubles to worry about, I'd be more godly. I'd have better character. You know, I'd, be, I'd have more perseverance if I just had more troubles to worry about. That would be wonderful. No, I mean, it's kind of this human experience, right, that we'd like to get rid of worry. We like to be free of care. And if that's the way life is, then why even try to be faithful to God? If this is true... Why should I even seek to live a faithful life to God? As a spiritual leader, Asaph struggled with this question, and some of us wrestle with it too. Look at what he said. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishments. If I had spoken out like that, if I had voiced these things publicly as a spiritual leader, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. One of my professors in seminary, he, he called this the blessed despair. It's, it's the wall of blessed despair. You know, you learn some great things about God. And, and it's exciting. You know, God is good, man. You have a Bible study. You, you come to church and you, just God speaks to you. You know, just meets your need in, in that moment. And then you go out and you get in a car accident. Man, I thought God was good, you know. <laughs> Not my experience. You know, you, you go to some youth conference like we did a couple weeks ago and you get charged up and revved up and you see all these young people worshiping and they just want to live out the cause and live for Christ. And then you go in your high school Monday morning and, they hate you because that's what you want. I mean, they may not hate you, but they're certainly not excited. There's no, there's no revival rally in your high school or your middle school uh, hallway, probably. I think God wants, to be, wants it to be there. But that can discourage us. And then we have this tension between what we see in reality and what God says life is truly all about. Asaph wanted to stay faithful. And the reality of what he saw and experienced was, oh, was almost unbearable. I mean, he, he wanted it, but it was just this great tension. And he almost gave up. He almost gave in. When I tried to understand this, it troubled me deeply. And for many of us, it's like a quick thought, and then we just give in. And we just try to, you know, we just live basically like our neighbors. Most of us. There's a whole lot of difference. But I hope this morning, You'll wrestle with this tension like Asaph. I hope, you'll, I hope you'll be troubled by this. I hope you'll be troubled as you think about your experience. And he struggled having a clear vision of life as God, as a God-following person until 
He left his isolation and joined God's people. He was struggling to have a clear vision. He was struggling to work out his experience and what God said because, I think, he was isolating himself. And you know how it is. You get crazy up in your own mind. I mean, just think back to a dating experience. Some of you young people, don't, don't be in a hurry to go experiment with this. All right? But just trust me. You, love will mess you all up. And I remember, uh, Laura and I, we were in college and I think we were about to get engaged, but we may have just, I think we were, I don't think we were engaged yet. And uh, I, basically, Laura was working in, in, the, in, the, in the kitchen, and I may have told the story before, but I, I go to meet with her, and, and it was like she looked at me in a certain way. She didn't argue with me or, you know, anything like that, but it was, it was like, she, like she responded to my, to my question in a way that just, I wasn't sure, does she still love me? I mean, in my own mind, I'm going, I'm just thinking, am I? Am I really going to marry her? <laughs> kind of woman responds to me like that. What is going on? I remember walking out just crazy in my head. And I, thankfully, thankfully, I go and I get in the car of a guy who was mentoring me, who had already been married, very you know, close friend and mentor. And I'm like, Scott, man, she looked at me like this. I don't think this is going to work out. And I remember, I mean, this was at a small town. You know, I mean, he jerked the car over. He grabbed me by my shoulder and said, Hey! You don't live your life by your feelings. Do you love her? Oh my God, do I? Yeah, yeah I told you, yes. <laughs> do, does she love you? And I'm like, oh. yeah, I think she loves me. All right, then, you're going to marry her. She loves yeah. you. Get over it, you know? And, and that, that was just laughable. That was history. And three kids later, here we are after 10 years. <laughs> Wonderful. But we get crazy when we get isolated. We get. We get crazy, and you're going to see what Asaph uh, says is, is actually pretty silly, but notice, he says, until, I was going crazy in my isolation, until I entered the sanctuary of God, and then I understood their final destiny. I didn't have it all clear because I was just going crazy over here. But when I entered the sanctuary, there, began, there was for me an environment in which I could now see clearly. Joining God's people helped Asaph see from a clear lens. Why do you come in here Sunday after Sunday? Now, I know some of y'all are new. Some of you may not even you know, be followers of Christ yet. And hopefully we'll have an increasing number of people who would, would be that way. But why do we come together... Essentially, we come together on Sundays for the family, right? The, the church family. And hear the same thing every Sunday. I mean, I'm not telling you anything new. I mean, probably most of y'all have read this psalm. or I mean, this isn't any great revelation. We're going to take communion and we're going to hear the same story. Jesus died and rose again. But what happens is I go out of here on Sunday. And then Monday and Tuesday, I tend to I live in my own world, right? We, we live in our own worlds. We have our own experiences, and we get off on our own. And the further we get away from God's people, God's presence in a corporate sense, the more crazy we get in our, in our thinking, in, our, in, our, in the way that we perceive the world. Worship gatherings help to reframe the way we see things. That's what they're designed to do. We have kind of a call to worship. We read scripture that helps us to realign our minds and our hearts around the things that are true. We sing songs that remind us of who God is and what He's really like, that call us to respond in some kind of way. And, and basically, they usually simply reaffirm what we already know. You know, I mean, unless it's early on in your Christian faith and journey, and I don't want to minimize that. I remember my first year of being a Christian when I was 20, everything was new. It was like every Sunday, man, I'd bounce up. I'm like, I can't wait to hear something. I remember reading the Bible. I remember it being in a van with my mentor, and we worked together. And I remember just reading my Bible in the van. I was reading 1 Thessalonians. I was like, Steve, can you believe what this says? And he's like, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, he's been a Christian for a long time. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, it was just awesome. Everything was new. And, and for some of you, that may be true. And that's awesome. And that's exciting. But, but you know, if you, after so many times, it's kind of, it's really reaffirming, reminding us, reminding us of the things that are already true. Now, what, is a wor what would a worship gathering in the sanctuary that Asaph would have been, have been a part of, what kind of things would they have been reaffirming? 
Several things. They would have been reaffirming that Yahweh, Yahweh is, is the name for God. I am who I am. God, the Lord. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. We were reminded of that this morning. Maybe you lost that a little bit this week. Maybe your life felt a little bit out of control. Maybe the harvest didn't come in this week like you wanted it to. You know, maybe you didn't get the shekels that you wanted to get for that bread that you were baking. Or, you know, stock selling or business or school. You didn't get the test that you wanted. Some of you right now, all you can think about is homework. You know, it's not going. But the Lord, hopefully, who is your God, is King of kings and Lord of lords. That's still true. He's still the Lord. He still reigns. It, it, also, these experiences help us to gain new awareness of His power and His honor. One of the uh, psalms that may have been read or sung early on, Psalm 62, 1 and 2, I'll read it. The, the, the tagline on the top says, For the director of music, for Jeduthun, a psalm of David. So this is for the director of music. This is for the composition of music to be sung in the sanctuary. It says this, Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from Him. Truly He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Oh, I just... Oh, yeah. Sometimes, you know... Once a week or twice a week or five times a week, i got to be reminded of that. And, and often it's, it's just, oh yeah, that's right. I got an email this morning that has shaken me up and it's going to change our lives. And my first response to that email is, oh God, what am I going to do? And then I just, start, I just try to start figuring out what am I going to do, what are my options. And thankfully I was in the bathroom. And... Uh, yeah, uh, I was in the bathroom, and the bathroom in my house is like the sanctuary. Some of y'all might be true. Some of y'all, I mean, for the women, it's like the last, you know, you run from the bathroom. But for men, in some cases, for me anyway, I just have these revelatory thoughts in the bathroom regularly. I mean, I have great times of prayer and worship and singing, and it's just the way it is. And uh, thankfully, I was in the bathroom when I was thinking about this, and I was just like, God, I, you know, you know what? I had just been reading this psalm, and I was just kind of had my worship, and, and the, the kind of anxiety, this email kind of freaked me out, and then I was like, oh God, before I try to figure this out, I trust you. You are my rock. You are my refuge. I'm going to hide myself in the shadow of your wings, and I just needed to be reminded of that this morning, and maybe... That's something that you need to be reminded of too. And when you gather together with people in worship, those are the kinds of things that help us to realign our perspective of our, our experience when it's intention of what we see and feel in our real life and, and what God says. When we worship together, we're reminded of God's truth, of who God is. We're able to go and live our lives in light of what is really true. So Asaph was able to, to realign his vision, realign himself to have the right perspective once he joined God's people in the sanctuary. It, it may have been that there were songs that were sung, like Psalm 62, and in the singing of those songs, that was part of an experience. It may have been that a priest uh, shared some things with him. Maybe the priest saw that his soul looked downcast and he began to speak some truth and some comfort and some grace into his life. It may have been others who helped with music and worship, who just in their serving reminded him of who God was and what the ultimate fate of the faithless will be. And probably it's a combination of all these things. His whole experience being in the corporate gathering of, 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 of followers of God helped remind him of things that were true. Now, notice the new perspective that Asaph received when he joined God and His people. Verses 18 to 22. I'm going to read it out of here, but it's on the screen. Surely you place them. This is the, the, the ultimate fate of those who are faithless. Surely you put them on a slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly they are destroyed. Completely swept away by terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so you, when you arise, O Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. 
When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. How smart is isolation? How helpful is isolation? It will turn you into a brute beast. It will turn you into Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> On all fours, eating grass. Eventually, you'll go crazy. Quit clipping your fingernails, hair growing out of your ears, and you'll just go nuts. I mean, that all might not happen. In reality, the way of the wicked, Asaph says, is slippery. It is not going to last. I see those people prospering. I see them getting what appears to be prosperity for their faithlessness. But when it really matters, it is going to slip off like a, like a, like a ski slope. <laughs> it's just going to slip off. No traction. No traction for the way of the faithless. And he says... Isolation is senseless, it's ignorant, and it results in brutalism. You probably know some people like that, right? Maybe you felt that way. Maybe in your own mind in this past week, you're just trapped. You didn't tell anybody else about the things that you've been thinking. And you have this whole scenario worked out in your mind and your heart about what you think is reality. And, and now, maybe even God is speaking to you now about, hey, that's... That's nuts. I'm in control. I'm, I'm a rock. I'm a refuge. I haven't changed. I am with you. Trust me. It's silly. There's another word for silly, but I didn't want to use it because I felt like it was too strong. But you can fill in the, fill in the gap there. It's silly to try to live apart from God and His people. I mean, coming to a worship service uh, once a week is not it. You can still live your life basically isolated. It's joining God and His people in the environment of worship. Those are all very important. A Christian living in isolation, it's like Tom Brady thinking that he is going to go out and beat the New York Giants by himself. It's like, I got this one. You know, he's like, no, nah, I don't need a snapper. I'll just hike it to myself. I see y'all out there. I got this, you know, hi, you know, and I'm just going to run around. I'm going to throw the ball to myself. I'm so good. I don't need y'all. All right, give me a center. Just give me a center and one receiver. We got this. That's full. That, I mean, that's not even, that's ridiculous. You know, that, of course that wouldn't happen. You know, in, in football, every, every one of those 11 guys is so important. One person makes a mistake, boom, it could be a sack, it could be an interception. The whole game could change in one play because you missed your spot. And that's, that's the way the church is. Every person, every one of you is a vital organ, a vital part of the body. And Paul says, when one part of the body suffers and hurts, the whole body is hurt, even though we don't feel it. Uh, Pastor John Tongue is going to be here next Sunday. And it is a, an honor, trust me, for us to have John coming. He's the English pastor of the Chinese Bible Church of Maryland. He probably won't mention this, to you, but he, he has recovered from cancer. Very serious cancer called GIST. And uh, when he discovered it, if I remember correctly, he had seven tumors uh, that were basically eating his whole inside. Uh, it was inoperable, and he, he, was, he was basically healed with this experimental drug. And if you want to hear about it, if, if he has a chance to talk to you before the service, ask him about it. It's a, a, this drug. And, uh, and, it sh and it stopped the growth of those tumors uh, and shrunk them so that they could get rid of the cancer. And he's cancer-free, stronger than ever. Uh, he will preach like he never preached. Um, just amazing. This just happened a few years ago. He did not know that he was about to die. And many churches don't realize we're on the brink of death. We don't even know it. It all seems like it's going so well. I mean, I can just... It, Laura and I were in Orlando a couple years ago. I think it was maybe even last year. And do you know what we saw down there? A drive-in church. I'm not joking. Well, I have pictures of this. A drive-in church. I'm just going to drive in, drop my envelope off. You know, I'm not even going to get out of my car. And that's the way many of us, we treat, you know, our, our, our faith. Like, we come on Sundays, and then... And then 
don't see me again. And that just hurts us. That's what isolation, it's just silly, it's ridiculous. But not only did Asaph overestimate the prosperity of the faithfulness, I'm sorry, of the faithless, but in his isolation, he underestimated his own prosperity. So here he's, he's overestimating how successful and how prosperous the faithless were really living. He thought it was just amazing. They were high on the hog. They didn't have a care in the world. They didn't experience the normal human ills. Way overestimated that. But he also underestimated his own prosperity. Look what he says as we read the last part of this psalm. Starting in verse 23. Yet, yet, now that he's been with God and his people... Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And on earth nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. Oh yeah, God, you are holding me in your right hand. You are holding me. You are identifying with me. Some of you young people, I probably all of you, your identification, your identity is huge. Some of you young adults, some of you parents, this is huge. And, and, and people who are experts in this and even people who are less than experts can tell that there's insecurity in your life. You act a certain way, you do certain things, and it, it, it shows uh, insecurity. So back when I was in high school, I had a Honda Accord. And it was a 1987 Accord. You know what that means. Boop! Flick up lights. Boop! That was the coolest thing. Man, I had some, I had some gold rims and 18-inch woofers. Dang, man. I wish I had some of them now. 18-inch woofers. And I would, I would, if it was just me or another, another one of my, my friends, uh, I'd pull down the seats in the back so that the woofers were just exposed in all of their thumping bass glory. And so you know how I had my seat, right? Back. <laughs> my seat was back so I could barely, that was this one, barely hit the gas, right? And, but then, the, then the, the back part of the seat was back. And, and generally, it was, yeah, it was one way or the other. If it was, it'd be like out the window, I wouldn't even be touching the back. The back would be like all the way down. I'd be like out the seat, you know? And, or it'd be like over to the side, but it's just like a girl in the seat, and I'd be over to this side. <laughs> Windows down, it could be 40 degrees. Windows down in Atlanta, so it was usually warm. And just so everybody could hear. I remember I worked at Publix, and I, I just remember I would, I would just, I'd be by myself, and I would roll down all the windows, and I would just blare the music as I was going into work, so people could hear me. They knew I was coming. Now, what does that tell people about me? I am totally insecure with who I am. I want you to think something about me that is totally not true. I want you to think I am so cool. I want you to just think I'm awesome. And I wasn't awesome. Well, I wasn't that awesome. Insecure because... I didn't realize that God was identifying with me. He's holding you by His right hand. That means He identifies with you. That means you have divine protection. That means when you need it, you have divine rescue. You have divine safety. For a time, Asaph experienced mocking and reproof earlier in the psalm. We looked at that. But the Lord will bring about a restoration to honor rather than shame. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward, you will take me into glory. You will honor me. Wow. 
and we see that God is not just active in the afterlife. It's not like God is preparing a mansion for you. He's just busy working for you right now so that when you get to heaven, you're going to have a sweet pad. And, you know, just kind of do whatever you want right now, but you've already put your trust in Him, you're going to go to heaven when you die. No, God is active right now. He's holding your hand right now. He's with you right now. He's present with you right now. He's not just active in the, uh, in the visible world. I'm sorry, he's, He is active in the visible world, not just in the invisible Holy Spirit part of the world that we don't see. He's active. He is active currently in your life, in your school, in your workplace, in your community. He has sent you to those places, and He was already there before you got there. He was already doing some things. He was calling you there. You may not have even realized it. Reality is clear. The faithless who live carefree, who Asaph and we are tempted to join, he almost gave in, but he said, I didn't ultimately give in. They will perish and be destroyed. Justice and judgment are coming. Now, we don't celebrate their destruction. I mean, it's not like today we're going, yeah, God's going to get them. Get them, God. I'm over here, man. We are in the sanctuary. We're in the sanctuary. We're safe. You know? No. No. We share this testimony, and the testimony is this. Our God reigns. Verse 28, as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell your deeds. I will not be quiet, God. I am not going to be quiet. Isolation, senseless, ignorant, and silly. That's our choice. We could be in isolation, overestimating the prosperity of the faithless. It is not as good as it looks. It's not as good as it looks. The prosperity that you might see, it's not as good as it looks. We underestimate our own prosperity. It is better. It is better for us than we ever realize. Every day, as Psalm 145 says, the greatness of God is unsearchable. Just keep searching. You'll keep seeing how great He is over and over again. He is great. He is awesome. How can we see clearly? How do we get this perspective? By joining God and His people. Committing to God and His people. Sunday celebration and worship certainly is part of that. Fellowship in small groups, that's part of it too. Service and outreach, that's an important part of it too. And you get together with a couple people and you go out, you serve people, you, you serve your community, you serve people that are needy. That helps remind us too of how great and awesome God is. We're reminded that God is with us. He can and will satisfy the longings of our heart and the hearts of those who are needy. And in Him, we have everything. I'm going to reread these last verses. And what we're going to do is we're going to... We're going to uh, uh, close this. We're going to apply this by taking communion and being reminded afresh and anew of, of what Christ has done in coming for us. So I'm going to read these verses and pray, and then we're going to respond with communion. Here's the last few verses. If you have your Bible, you can follow along. It's up on the, up on the screen. Wherever you are, friend, wherever you are, whatever your perspective is, whatever vision you currently have of life, Listen to these words and realign your heart to what God says is true. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And on earth there is nothing I desire. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all of your deeds. As we bow and and prayer, if you want to just hold out your hands or hold your hands up, in just a few minutes we'll, well, we'll stand when we take communion. But uh, just to express to God, God, you are mine. Maybe you just say that in your heart. God, you are mine. You are my God. You are my rock. You are my refuge. 
Wherever my perspective on life has been out of whack, God, this morning I bring it to you. I, I ask your Holy Spirit to help me to realign the way I see things according to what's true. The way of the faithless is, is slippery. just slips on down an icy slope. The way of the faithful is like a rock. Thank you, God, for holding us by your right hand. Thank you for being willing to identify with us. Thank you for the security that we have in you. Thank you for the safety that we have in you. God, may we this week learn to say, Oh God, whom have we in heaven but you? And on earth there is nothing we desire but you. May you fill our cups. May you truly satisfy and quench our greatest needs. God, we want to reaffirm our love for you. If you're here this morning and you don't know this God, you can know him. He wants to know you. He's drawing you to himself just by the fact that you're here. And you can just cry out to him right now in your own words. In your heart, he'll hear you. We're about to celebrate communion, which reminds us that Jesus came from heaven and lived a perfect and sin sinless life. He died in your place and in my place, and He rose from the dead, proving, demonstrating that He was God and that the Father accepted His death for sin. You can turn your life over to God this morning. He reigns. And if you will put yourself under His reign by trusting in His Son, you will have life. That life begins the moment you put your trust in Him and lasts forever. And if that's your desire, let somebody know. Let, let one of us know after the service. God, as we partake in this communion table, we recognize that we haven't merited or earned your favor. We haven't, uh, we haven't been worthy this week to, to come. We haven't been... We haven't been anything other than desperate for you. And, and so, God, we come uh, to this table of grace to be reminded that you did for us what we could not do for ourselves. We pray for this time to be a blessing to each one of us and to you.